Open the pod bay doors, Tom. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What would you do with a brain if you had one? Do? Why, if I had a brain, I could... Miles per hour. I could wire away. 46, 56 degrees. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, and uh, I can't see a thing in these lights, so I'm going to step over to the side. Um, I'm uh, Pete Makovicki. I'm a curator uh, of paleontology at the Field Museum. Curator is one of our staff research titles. Um, and so I spend my time um, going out there uh, digging up dinosaurs. We get prepared in our lab. We give them names. We figure out how they're related to one another and to the birds that are alive today and try and figure out a little bit about how they may have lived, which is, of course, very relevant to the movie we're going to see today. Um, so I want to sort of do a little preamble, a little setup to the movie. Um, and, and I've done this one before, Jurassic Park, but I really like it because it came at a very um, important time in my life. Um, can I get the next slide, Noah, please? Okay. Um, yeah, can you go to the slideshow? Um, this icon down here. I don't sing and dance, in spite of what you may think. Um, or I can, but it'll be very embarrassing for my family that's here. Um, so, uh, as I was saying, Jurassic Park actually sort of came at a very important time for me. Um, I was in grad school doing my master's when this movie came out, and so um, I felt a little like these uh, cartoon characters. I don't know if uh, those of you in the back can read it, but um, there's a paleontologist who says, man, paleontology sucks these days, and the museum visitor says, why? And uh, she says, well, Jurassic Park came out 15 years ago. So, says the other person. And uh, the paleontologist says, well, today's grad students got into dinosaurs after seeing it as kids. They don't care about fossils. Um, before they had living dinosaurs handed to them by Hollywood, I was out in Texas digging up Acrocanthosaurus teeth. Oh, so you were into dinosaurs when they were still underground. <laughs> exactly. And, and so, I sort of got into dinosaurs again when they were still underground before uh, Jurassic Park came along. And so I was a regular grad student. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, go, on, go ahead one more. We'll, we'll skip the quote. Um, so I was sort of a grad student in the usual grad student mold, kind of goofy looking and dorky. And nobody really understood what I was doing until uh, the movie came out. And the next slide, please. I transformed into something more like this, at least in my own mind. Um, but basically, uh, jokes aside, this sort of was a watershed moment in the sense that um, dinosaurs very much became part of the public awareness. And not just dinosaurs as sort of the symbol of something large, terrible, and terrifying that went extinct but as, as a type of science, as trying to understand these creatures, how they might have lived and behaved and interacted with one another. And so um, that really sort of, I think, allowed me to connect my science, what I do every day, much more with people, much more readily. Uh, and, and it happened almost overnight. Um, next slide, please. And so uh, one of the reasons for that was at, with the Jurassic Park series, they actually had a consultant scientist uh, on board. So you'll see on the upper left there um, with the rather high forehead is uh, my colleague Jack Horner, who recently retired uh, from the Museum of the Rockies in, in Montana. And he was actually a consultant on this movie. And there was a, a real conscious effort, I think, by by the directors and the producers of this movie to put as much science uh, into it to make it somewhat accurate. They didn't just sort of, uh, you know, cast reason to the wind and, and make the movie as dramatic as possible. Um, now, Jack has been a consultant on the subsequent movies, two, two three, and, and, and then the Jurassic World, which have 
frankly, uh, moved away from science a little bit. But uh, there, there was a real effort here um, to at least uh, align it with what some people in the field thought. And so you'd start getting a lot of questions at cocktail parties or uh, wherever one went from, from people being interested back then in the mid-90s. Um, and so in that theme, I kind of wanted to bring up another fossil. Next slide, please. Um, <laughs> Actually, this, this is getting a little, you know, we're talking paleontology here. I don't think my kids will actually know who this is. But uh, those of us who are a little older will remember uh, Dave Letterman uh, on his uh, show used to have this segment where he's like, 10 things you maybe didn't know. And so I thought we could play that kind of a game um, with Jurassic Park this afternoon. So I will point out 10 things, um, 10 scenes from the movie that uh, I want you to kind of pay attention to. And then once the movie's done, we'll return to those 10 scenes and talk a little bit about the science, um, where they might have gotten it right, where they might have gotten it wrong. And I basically picked these 10 scenes because um, this is the type of question I most frequently get from people, um, and also because they're some of the more fun parts of the movie. So um, let's uh, dive into it. Noah, next slide, please. I already introduced that. We'll go one ahead. So um, the first part of the movie, of course, uh, the scientists go out there and they find this amber. Um, it's fossilized tree sap. It has insects in it. And uh, they basically extract the contents from those insects. They happen to be mosquitoes that drank blood, supposedly on dinosaurs. And so you have this dinosaur blood trapped inside the amber that you know you can use to clone dinosaurs. Um, so I'm always being asked about the, the the possibility of that really happening. So we'll talk a little about that. Um, next slide, please. Um, there's also a scene where people are finding dinosaurs using remote sensing. In this case, seismic technology. Um, very frequently, I get asked about what kind of technologies we'll use. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, next slide, please. How do we excavate dinosaurs? Um, in this movie, uh, we see a lot of dinosaur excavation happening rather rapidly. Next slide, please. Um, and they sort of just pick the bones out of the ground and show them around. Um, Okay, so I don't get asked a lot about this, but this really bothers my sensitivities as a paleontologist. So we'll talk about that as well. Um, next slide, please. DNA cloning. So this gets back to the same issue as the amber. How realistic are the technologies that were presented in the movie? Uh, now slowly going on 20 years old. Um, next slide, please. Um, I get a lot of, asked a lot about spitting dinosaurs spitting venom thanks to this uh, particular character, Dilophosaurus. Um, what's the story behind that? Why did that even make it into the movie? We'll talk a little bit about that. Next slide. Um, this is one of the famous scenes in the movie where um, Dr. Grant, the protagonist, is telling the kids not to move because T-Rex hunts by sight and if you stand still it won't see you. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about whether that's a realis realistic assumption about dinosaurs or not. Uh, Next slide. Can you lift your speaker? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hello? It's... Hello? Hello? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Um, the Jeep scene. Uh, this is a famous scene where a T-Rex is chasing a Jeep with our protagonist in it um, at quite dramatic speeds. Um, there's some actual science done uh, behind this and some of my colleagues have even commented on it. So that's, that's a fun one to discuss. How do we know how fast dinosaurs ran? Um, how can we get at that question? And next slide, please. Naked velociraptors. They look more mean when they're reptilian, but they weren't, sorry. And we'll talk about how we know that and what we think they might have looked like. Next slide, please. Um, and then there's a scene where there's a Brachiosaurus, you know, sort of gently chewing on plant matter before it sneezes all over the poor young girl there. Um, 
what do we know about dinosaurs chewing and, and, and eating? How did they eat? So one more behavior question. So those are my 10 points, um, sort of, and then we'll get back to them Letterman style, but um, I want to get on to the movie, so please enjoy. If you have any questions you think about, try to write them down or memorize them. And besides the 10 things we, we talked about uh, that I'll talk about here, um, there'll be a chance for some Q&A so we can sort of go through your other questions. So please enjoy the movie and thanks again for coming. Anyway, that was uh, quite fun. There was a lot more, uh, somebody was just telling me they'd heard a lot more conversation than they remembered, which is always good. Um, so let's get back to um, our slideshow and, and um, some of the questions we were asking. So um, can you go one slide forward, please? Okay, I hope you did, in the dark. <laughs> one more slide, please. Um, so we're going to go back to our 10 points that I raised um, and talk a little bit about them. And then, of course, if you guys have any questions or any points in the movie you want to bring up, uh, please feel free to do so. Uh, next slide, please, Noah. So the amber, right? So in the beginning of the movie, we see the lawyer go out and visit a uh, amber mine um, in the Caribbean and they show us the mosquito trapped in the amber and as we go on the tour at Jurassic Park we see that they find these mosquitoes in amber they say they're a hundred million years old they drill into the amber they extract the blood from the abdomen of the mosquito they sequence it fix the gaps in the DNA and create a dinosaur so how realistic is that well Let's look at this amber. So um, next slide, please. And we're going to look at it from the perspective of the mosquito. So this is a family tree of insects, if you will. I don't expect you to be able to read the names up there. They're all in Latin anyway. But in the red box, you have the family to which the uh, blood-sucking mosquitoes belong. And we can see that that family sort of split off from the other uh, things it's related to a little bit before 100 million years ago. Now, this is a, a family tree that's been built using DNA and dated, uh, the, the dates on it come from inferring the lengths of those branches using DNA and, and some fossils to calibrate them. So, all right, biting mosquitoes might actually go back more than 100 million years. Fair enough, so we could potentially have some dinosaurs that would leave their blood in a mosquito. Uh, next slide, please. And so looking at the um, menagerie of animals that we saw in the movie, um, a number of them were from the Cretaceous, like the Triceratops, um, T-Rex, and even the uh, Velociraptors would be young enough, theoretically, to be, uh, to have, oh, another technical difficulty. But we have some dinosaurs in, in that menagerie that would have theoretically been young enough um, according to this. Um, I saw it flash up and disappear again. Um, but then we actually have some dinosaurs. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, go two ahead, please. Yeah, so there. We actually have some dinosaurs, like the Dilophosaurus, the one that was supposedly spitting venom, that are actually far too old. Dilophosaurus is from the beginning of the Jurassic period, close to 200 million years old, and actually predates the uh, evolution of biting mosquitoes. So the idea that you could actually get this blood um, and out of mosquitoes and create all of these animals from different time periods wouldn't even work theoretically. Moreover, the amber that they are actually showing us comes from the Dominican Republic. Uh, next slide, please. And we know that those amber deposits are much, much younger than the age of dinosaurs. They're approximately uh, 25 to 40 million years old. So while we do have amber um, from places like Burma that is old enough uh, to have insects in it and that were around during the age of dinosaurs, the particular amber they were showing us actually wouldn't fit the bill. 
So they were stringing a lot of things together here, and we'll talk to about the DNA uh, in just a second. Next slide, please. Now, after we see the amber, we go on a trip to what's supposed to be the Montana Badlands. It's actually shot out in the Miocene Badlands behind LA. Um, but, um, you know, serves the purpose. Um, and we see our, our friendly group of paleontologists simply blowing and brushing the dirt away from their exquisitely preserved uh, velociraptor specimen. And um, anyone who's actually dug fossils really chuckles at this, and I, I still continue to chuckle at it. Um, perhaps the most egregious uh, part of this, next slide, is when they're picking the nose of the velociraptor. I mean, they just stick their finger in there and, and get the nose out. Um, that's not really how we dig fossils. Next slide, please, and start. Um, so fossils are often buried quite deep. We have to remove a lot of overburden, overlying rock. It's, of course, lithified. It is a rock, and you might have to use something as massive as a jackhammer or at least pickaxes. Um, so yes, we do use brushes. Uh, we like to keep, keep, sorry, keep clean surfaces on, as we work. But you're actually removing rock. Uh, you are not just, you know, blowing sand away. There's, there's really no place where you would be digging uh, dinosaur fossils that easily. Um, there are places where the rocks certainly are softer than others, but never would you actually just sort of blow them off like that. How deep do you uh, it, it's going to be, it's going to vary uh, from site to site. Um, so you want a little bit on the surface. Um, you actually have to see the bones eroding out to locate it. But then it might go into a hill. In this case where, um, this is Aaron Hoyer, one of my field crew. Um, that hole that we started up that's kind of defined uh, a lot at his shoulder height, that probably ended up being 12 feet deep. So sometimes you go, you go fairly far in. Um, yeah, yeah, and and sometimes it's quite shallow. Sometimes they're right on the surface. So I've I've had situations where you dig a few inches, and others where you you go in ten feet. Um, not quite um, gold. You'd often be panning. Um, in here, you're actually you're looking for the the fossil emerging from the rock, eroding. Usually, it'll crumble and fall down the hill, and you you track it up. Um, so that brings us to the next uh, item, which is next slide, please, um, related to your question there. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, um, well, in two we'll get to yours. So this claw sort of is this recurring theme throughout the movie. We see Dr. Grant kind of pocket it as he just brushes the dirt off. He uh, scares the bejesus out of this poor boy with it, um, then puts it in his pocket. At some point, it stabs him, and he sort of drops it out of the tree that he's uh, taking shelter in with the kids. Um, I've got to say, that is probably the most robust fossil I would ever have seen. Um, fossils are extremely fragile. Uh, so. They were, of course, once bone, um, but they've become permineralized. Um, their composition has altered. And one of the things that makes bone um, strong, it, it's a, it's a two-part, um, it's a two-component, um, essentially, uh, compound. It's got organic material, uh, collagen, that creates a sort of flexible um, matrix that is then mineralized. Um, when it becomes a fossil, that protein, that collagen disappears and bones become extremely brittle. So next slide, please. Um, and you can start that. And this is not a very exciting uh, clip, but um, is the movie not loading? OK. Well, what you would have seen if this movie had loaded, uh, I'm afraid it didn't, um, is uh, that you would actually have a lot of uh, glue being dripped on. These are actually dinosaur eggshells um, that we're just trying to cover. Uh, we spend an incredible amount of time gluing things in the field, uh, in the lab, and um, basically we need to keep these things together. They're extremely fragile. They fall apart very easily. The idea of sticking a fossil claw or any other bone in your pocket and just uh, traveling around, around the world with it is, 
quite ludicrous, um, especially something as, as precious as a Velociraptor claw. So um, if you buy a fossil somewhere at, at Dave's Rock Shop in Evanston or something, treat it with care um, because they are very fragile. Um, now, next slide, please. So um, this brings us back to your question about finding fossils. So we see this um, scene in the movie where uh, we have uh, a seismic signal. Two guys get on a dolly um, with a shotgun shell, and they basically um, it knocks a, an impactor into the ground. And then the sound waves that result from that are picked up by microphones as they travel through the rock layers. And in the movie, on the screen, you see a beautiful skeleton of a velociraptor just magically appear. Um, I get asked a lot when I go, what, what kind of um, remote sensing technologies do we use to find fossils? And I have to say, we don't use any. Um, this approach has been tried with fossils. And there's one instance where someone claimed moderate success, and every other attempt to replicate it doesn't work. Um, basically, um, the sound waves traveling through the rock bodies are mo encountering so many different uh, changes in density between different types of rock that the, the small volume of fossil you would find really does not give you a signal. So um, at the time the movie was made, people were talking about this. Um, it was seen as a possibility. It really hasn't panned out. Now, there is one dinosaur that was found by seismic technology. Next slide, please. And it's an abelosaur called Ekrixinatosaurus, which basically means explosion dinosaur uh, in Greek. Um, and it was found by a seismic crew in uh, Argentina. Um, but the way they found it is these guys didn't use sort of the dolly. They actually used dynamite for their, um, for their signal. And these were oil, uh, an oil seismic crew. They're looking for major sediment. And they basically drill holes into the rock, drop in a stick of dynamite, and then they have their microphones picking up the sound waves going through. And it was that dynamite blowing out the hole that uh, recovered the dinosaur in, in a number of pieces. So if anything, seismic is probably not the way to find your dinosaurs. Um, next slide, please. So we get to the DNA part. This is uh, one of the most recurring questions I, I get from people. Um, how possible is it to extract dinosaur DNA? How possible would it be to clone a dinosaur? Um, and unfortunately, it's not <laughs> in the sense, um, not that we want to clone dinosaurs, but if we had their DNA, um, we could actually use it to answer a lot of questions about their evolutionary relationships. And uh, right around the time that Jurassic Park um, appeared, um, there was one or two scientific papers uh, that claimed they had found dinosaur DNA. Um, basically, what they did is they, they ground up some fossil bone, they extracted uh, some DNA from it, they amplified it, ran it through PCR, and then got some sequence that they couldn't really match up with anything else. Um, and they said, because it doesn't look like anything we recognize, it's got to be from a dinosaur. Mm -hmm. um, it turned out, after several years of, of, of intense research, that it was human DNA. It was um, a fragment of mitochondrial DNA that at some point had been copied into the nucleus it wasn't really doing anything, so it had accumulated a lot of weird neutral substitutions, and therefore it didn't immediately look like anything recognizable. But it turns out people have these, as well as other organisms, and they could actually go down to the very lab tech whose DNA it turned out to be. So there was sort of a, a, a false positive. Um, but some of you who may have read the newspapers this week might have seen something um, that was very interesting in this regard. Next slide, please. Um, so we don't have dinosaur DNA, but we now have at least three or four different studies in, in three different labs um, that purport that they have found dinosaur protein. 
So basically, if you remember, I just talked a little bit about the composition of bone. Bone essentially in a developing animal will form as, as a network uh, or a matrix of, of cartilage fibers, of collagen, that then gets infilled with um, mineralizations of calcium phosphate. Um, and what scientists, my colleagues, um, both in, in the United States and Canada now, as well as the UK, claim is that they've actually been able to isolate some of that collagen, some of that uh, organic matrix of the bone, that it's preserved in rare and exceptional cases. Um, and they might, they have a, done a couple of studies on um, Cretaceous dinosaurs, and now there was one, a study last week claiming maybe even an early Jurassic dinosaur, something that would have lived alongside Dilophosaurus that you saw. So we are certainly, in, in a sense, one step closer to finding dinosaur DNA. Next slide, please. And I say that because, of course, protein, as you can see at the bottom of this slide, um, is uh, the product that is, derives from uh, decoding DNA itself. So we don't have the DNA of the dinosaurs, but we have um, the proteins that those DNAs code for, and we can do some back transcription to sort of figure out the possibilities for what the DNA strands might have been for this one particular um, set of um, a DNA that codes for collagen in bone. Um, so we are getting a little bit of information. It's really only there for three or four dinosaurs now, but I think with these new studies, we're going to see an acceleration in this field of study. And so um, somewhere down the line, we may be able to build those family trees like I showed you the one for insects with the mosquitoes. Um, to do that for dinosaurs using not just their skeletal anatomy, but perhaps some information from uh, their protein sequences. How, how in the world does a protein last 80 million years? Well, that's, that's a good question. Um, this uh, is just out. Um, the way they located these proteins is they basically um, took the samples, dissolved them, and then um, put them through a spectrometer, a mass spectrometer, um, and came out with these protein sequences. They claim to have done this in an extremely sterile environment where contamination wouldn't exist. Um, just exactly why you would get protein preservation, I mean, the, the sort of orthodoxy has been that this all disappears, and that's, for example, why dinosaur bones are um, so, so brittle or fragile. Um, why would you have exceptional cases where some trace amounts of this might be preserved? I don't know. Um, people have talked about various sort of preservational conditions. Um, so I think there's, this is really very sort of nascent, and I think there'll be a lot, a lot of questions arising. And indeed, the first few studies that were done on this were met with a lot of skepsis for this very reason. But they've been able to replicate it. It's been done in a couple of different labs, so, so there's probably something to it. Um, and um, I, I, you know, I, I've just read these papers right now. I, I can't tell you why you would have these exceptional preservations. Um, but one thing we are learning, and, and we'll get back to this later, is that we are preserving more and more things that, than, than we ever expected maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, so we're learning, for example, that about the colors of dinosaurs from, from some of their skin preservation. Um, next slide, please. So this is another uh, one that, you know, sort of I get amused by and, and a lot of questions. It's sort of the idea that um, T-Rex would uh, sort of have, its vision would be based on motion, and so if you stood dead still um, in front of it, it would, it would fail to see you and, and not make a meal of you. Uh, so it's, it's unclear where this comes from. Um, the best that I've been able to deduce, next slide, is that um, it's based on predators, large predators today. So most mammalian predators, um, have eyes, uh, so in, in your eyes there are two kinds of, of cells for photoreception, for, for seeing with essentially. Um, there are rods and cones. Um, rods see in black and white, they detect light but not color, and cones detect color. Um, 
And most mammalian predators have very few cones. That's why we, we think our dogs are colorblind. It's, it's basically based on the lack of these cones. And we know that modern mammalian predators very much have a vision system, the underlying n nervous pathways that are triggered by movement. And so people obviously then decided when they were making the T-Rex in the movie that they would translate that over. Um, and I know for a fact that, that this is true of mammalian predators because we used to have a dog, Zoe. Great black lab, used to come in the field with me, loved going in the field. And she would chase jackrabbits, a lot of fun. She's kind of a stumpy dog, so she never got close to them. But you'd often see like the jackrabbits would, or cottontails would sometimes have this thing where they just freeze, just like in the movie. And she would be standing six feet from them and like, where did it go? Um, and so, you know, we, we do see that in mammalian predators. However, let's bear in mind that, of course, um, T-Rex is a dinosaur, and as a dinosaur is, of course, closely related to living birds. And we know that birds not only have great color vision, um, but their eyes are, they have extreme acuity, and they aren't necessarily tied to sort of uh, seeing things move as much. Um, for example, vultures, um, black vultures and various other vultures, will spot carcasses, which by definition are not moving, um, from, uh, from up to 1,000 or 2,000 feet up um, in altitude. So the idea that T-Rex that should somehow have a, a mammalian-like hunting uh, vision and, and behavior seems a little uh, far-fetched. Next slide, please. Oh, and while we're at it, um, we do know a little bit about uh, T-Rex's capabilities. Um, so we know that uh, T-Rex had fantastic vision. Um, this is a, a cast of, of a Tyrannosaurus skull um, where somebody actually fit balloons that would be the size of the eyeball into it. Um, so these, this animal had, uh, you know, sort of grapefruit-sized eyes and while we can't say anything about the density of um, vision cells in there, which is a, a very important factor in acuity, just the pure size of the eye tells you something about um, how much light could come in and how much uh, sort of photoreceptive area would be. And just by virtue of those two measures, we know that T-Rex had fantastic vision. Um, on your right hand, that's actually a model of uh, the T-Rex brain. And that sort of second lump going from the left to the right, uh, where it says CER, those are the um, optic lobes, the parts of the brain that deal with vision. They're expanded, they're large. So we have no reason to think that T-Rex had anything but fantastic vision. Um, next slide, please. Now, um, I get asked a lot about uh, the Dilophosaurus. People are sort of fascinated with the idea of dinosaurs potentially being venomous. Um, there's absolutely no evidence for this. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Dilophosaurus and, and a number of related animals have this little notch. You'll see on the right hand under the, the nostril there, there's sort of a little um, wiggle in the line of the jaw in front of the teeth there. Perhaps based on that, the um, movie directors put in a venom gland or something like that. Um, but really, there is no evidence that dinosaurs are venomous. We know, of course, that birds are evolved from dinosaurs. There are no venomous birds. There are a few poisonous birds, um, but these birds basically get their poison from the things they eat and build it into their tissues. Um, but there are no archosaurs, no birds or crocodilians that produce their own uh, venom. So there's really, this is purely artistic license on, on the part of the, the movie makers here. Next slide, please. So um, this was sort of an interesting one. So we of course have the, the super villain from uh, Jurassic Park are these velociraptors. Um, they're extremely cunning, intelligent, ferocious, um, and they just look mean with that reptilian look. Um, now, the movie came out 
merely a year or two before some very fantastic fossils started appearing in Cretaceous beds in northeast China and completely changed the way we think dinosaurs look. Next slide, please. So this is a skeleton of a small uh, dromaeosaur, the family that Velociraptor belongs to. This one happens to be called Microraptor because it is indeed very small. That scale bar is about six inches long. Um, but it has uh, a number of features that unite it with, um, with Velociraptor and other dromaeosaurs. It has that enlarged claw on the, on the hind foot, among other things. The back turned pubis. Um, if I took Dr. Grant's um, fake seismic uh, Velociraptor and put it next to there, I could point it out. I should have done that. Um, but what all of you will see is that besides the bones on this slab, there's a whole number of other um, dark structures which unmistakably are feathers. Next slide, please. And here we actually are zooming in on them. Um, so to all extents and purposes, these are modern flight feathers. You could go out and, and find a, a flight feather from a Canada goose out on the, in the park here or something, and it would be essentially the same. You see there's a shaft, um, there's a leading edge of the feather that's uh, not as wide as the uh, trailing edge of the feather. That's an aerodynamic feature. So we actually now know that these um, the dromaeosaurs and a variety of other um, carnivorous dinosaurs had plumage, just like birds that descended from them. Um, that plumage in some cases seems to have aerodynamic function like we see here. And if we turn to Velociraptor itself, next slide please. Um, it comes from uh, a desert sediment, from desert sediments that don't tend to preserve uh, the skin or skin structures. But um, if we look at the top two uh, figures in this, uh, this is a paper we wrote in 2007. So there's the ulna, the funny bone of Velociraptor. Uh, the elbow end is to your left. And if you zoom in on that red box, you can actually see that there's a number of little um, sort of bumps or tubercles on that bone. And we think they correspond to um, the attachment points for the large uh, feathers on the wing that you see in some birds. So C and D are actually uh, bird bones, vultures in this case, and you can see that there's a little line of bony bumps on there, and in the unprepared specimen beneath you can see that what those bony bumps correspond to the major secondary uh, rem remages or, or flight feathers. Um, and there's basically a tendon there that holds those in place. So we think we have evidence of that in Velociraptor. And next slide, please. So if we actually take and combine the evidence we have for um, all the various fossils from northeastern China and Velociraptor and so on, we come up with a very different image of these animals. Um, one where they're covered in a plumage of feathers, um, and we also think that a lot of these feathers would have had um, varied coloring. We can actually, in some cases, find uh, patterns of um, melanosomes, of color cells preserved in them um, that allow us or give us some idea of coloration. So rather than the sort of reptilian looking velociraptors of the movies, we now have a very different, much more bird-like image of these animals. Next slide, please. So the Jeep scene, um, this is sort of an interesting one, uh, both from a scientific perspective and from a movie making perspective. So um, we see uh, sort of the three characters, Dr. Malcolm, Dr. Sattler, and, and, and the gamekeeper get in the Jeep, the T-Rex is crashing after them, um, and we see sort of Basically, it's, it's a manual shift Jeep. We see the gamekeeper go from first through second, third, and into fourth. I forget which one is, is the part where Dr. Malcolm kicks the gear shift out. Um, and the T-Rex is almost on them and bumping the side of the car until they, they shift into fourth and they get away um, at, you know, presumably in excess of the 32 miles an hour that their T-Rex was clocked at. Um, now that, that's a pretty high speed for a very large animal. Um, generally, uh, the fastest animals we know are uh, 
mid-size animals. Once animals get over, uh, you know, half or, or a whole ton, uh, their weight becomes a problem in terms of speed. So that kind of speed for a T-Rex seems very unrealistic, um, even though they do have adaptations for large muscles in their legs and so on. So what's going on here? Um, well, let's go to the next slide. We can sort of test this, as, as a couple of my colleagues did uh, in 2002, by building a model of T-Rex. And um, what they essentially did was they took one leg of T-Rex. They, they made a very simplified mechanical model and said, OK, uh, T-Rex is a biped like us. At some point, as it's walking or if it were running, um, all of its weight would be on one foot as the other one is being moved forward. Um, so we can use that simplifying assumption, the fact that the whole weight of the animal has to be held up by the foot um, you know, during movement or locomotion. And um, we can then sort of say, OK, we, we have some idea of how much T-Rex weighed based on models and so forth. Um, saying that T-Rex weighed 6,000 kilograms, about six metric tons, um, assuming that what would the forces acting on the different joints be uh, on that leg as the other one was lifted? So they basically created a bunch of joints in their computer model at the hip, at the knee, at the, um, and at the ankle, loaded it with 6,000 uh, pounds, and then tried to figure out how much force would it take to prevent the knees from buckling or the ankles from buckling. Um, and then translate that force into how much muscle it would take because we have a good idea of um, how strong vertebrate muscles are. And um, of course, the faster the animal is going, the more that there's an impact on that one leg, um, the greater those forces will be, the greater the amount of muscle will be. Next slide, please. Furthermore, you can sort of actually go in and, and model these muscles based on what we know of, of living, the an anatomy in living animals. Um, see how much muscle you can pack in there. Um, but the take home message is that if you have an animal running at 30 miles an hour uh, that weighs six tons, more than half its body weight would have to simply be muscles in one of its hind limbs. So if you add it to two hind limbs, then you have more than its body weight. Um, basically, you can't put enough muscle on a T-Rex hind leg to make it run more than, at best, 20 miles an hour. Um, and if we go back two slides, uh, one interesting thing that uh, these two fellows, uh, John Hutchinson and, and his colleague, uh, after this study, they went back and, and rewatched this scene and what you'll notice is, um, if you watch it closely, uh, the T-Rex at no point is actually running. And um, running here is defined as having a suspended phase. So I'm walking if I have two feet at the ground at one time. I'm running if there's actually a phase where I have none of, neither of my feet on the ground. There's a jumping phase. So that's, that's the te technical definition of running. And you never actually see that in the movie. Um, this animal is walking. It always has at least one and sometimes both feet on the ground, even though it's supposedly going at 30 miles an hour. And so uh, my colleague John actually called Universal Studios and is like, how did you make this happen? And it turned out their own animators, their CGI artists, they tried to make it run and, and, and it just looked ridiculous. So then they speeded it up and it sort of looked like the Roadrunner, um, you, know, you know, from Wile E. Coyote with its legs spinning. And so they basically had it moving at, at a speed that looked very normal and then did a bunch of other tricks with cutting to the Jeep and the gear shift and the, you know, the speedometer and, and moving the vegetation by at a, at a certain rate. But the animal itself is not actually moving at 30 miles an hour if you were to look at the pace of the footfalls and how it was moving. So there's a whole bunch of CGI trickery there. Um, please go forward to.
and one more. And then this, this is sort of one of the ones that, that's really funny um, in the sense that um, Dr. Grant tells the kids, oh, think of it as a large cow. And indeed, this, this brachiosaurus behaves in a very cow-like manner. It's, it's chewing on the branch that they hand it. Um, and this one personally bugs me because dinosaurs don't chew. Um, you saw it's in the scene. You saw how its um, lower jaw was moving back and forth in a chewing motion, um, and that's a very mammalian behavior. We have grinding teeth with little cusps and valleys that interlock and allow us to grind uh, our food up. And in order to do so, we have a loose um, articulation in our jaw, which can translate. Our jaw can actually move a little bit sideways as we chew. Dinosaurs can't do that. Next slide, please. So if we look at the skull of Brachiosaurus on the left, um, you'll see that the teeth uh, are sort of lined up um, with the uh, upper and lower arcades uh, set under each other. And if you were to look at the jaw joint, it only allows an up and down movement. If we zoom in on the teeth of Brachiosaurus, you'll see that um, they lack all the cusps and, and the valleys that you need for chewing. And there's almost no wear on them. Um, just at that front tooth on the left-hand side, you'll see there's a little edge of yellow where it's been worn down. And that's because they're really just using these teeth to kind of rake vegetation in. Um, there's really no chewing going on. And if you don't want to believe me, there's no chewing going on. Next slide, please. All you have to do is look at what comes out the other end of the dinosaur. And this is a piece of uh, dinosaur poo, uh, we think made by uh, titanosaur sauropods in, in South America about 100 million years ago. And you can see there's whole pieces of branches in there um, that are about two inches long. Um, this is basically raked in, passed through the gut where it ferments, and then passed out rather undigested. So um, no chewing going on in dinosaurs. And in fact, um, one of the reasons that dinosaurs may have gotten this big, as big as Brachiosaurus, around 38 tons, is because they didn't chew. Um, there have been some calculations done on mammals. And um, if you look at, for example, the uh, physiology of an elephant, the amount of energy and food it needs to bring in and how long it chews it, there's a theoretical maximum where a large mammal above 18 tons would have to chew more, uh, spend more time chewing than feeding uh, in a way that it couldn't sustain itself. Um, so perhaps the fact that dinosaurs didn't chew is one of the factors that allowed them to get as big as they did. So um, those are my 10 points. Next slide, please. Um, before I go on to the Q&A session, I want to thank everyone for coming and staying. Uh, here, uh, just a few updates. We're opening a couple of new exhibits at the Field Museum that are of interest. Um, the first one is specimens. It's going to open in a couple of months. Um, and we're basically bringing out some of the rarely seen treasures, the most significant uh, objects and specimens uh, from a scientific perspective. Um, as uh, Noah said earlier, we have close to 30 million objects in our specimens. You see a couple of percent of those in our halls. Most of them are kept away, but we're now doing a special exhibit uh, where we're bringing those out and we're, we're telling the stories behind them. Um, so that's opening uh, in a couple of months. And then next year we'll have an uh, exhibit on Antarctic dinosaurs, um, basically telling the geological history of Antarctica uh, using fossils uh, from various eras and showing you some uh, brand new dinosaurs that we haven't even named yet. Um, so with that, I'd like to say, uh, open the floor for questions. Uh, yeah, uh, we, we do think that there might have been vocalization. Um, birds, of course, as dinosaur descendants vocalize. And we know that crocodilians, which are their closest sort of uh, living relatives, also will vocalize, especially male 
uh, alligators in, in the breeding season. So some use of vocalization is, is probable. Um, there are some hadrosaurs, duck-billed dinosaurs, that have sort of elongated their nasal, nasal bones into various structures, um, and the air passages run through them, the, the nasal passage, uh, probably as some kind of resonating chamber. Um, they could have made different noises. So we do think, yeah, that, that some dinosaurs, but whether Brachiosaurus did, no, wait, that's, that's conjecture. Now, they, uh, people do experiments with filling the cavity of the uh, skull to get an idea of the brain. Anybody doing any research in this resonance of them making noise? Um, there's been a little bit uh, of work, but it's, it's basically on these crested duck-billed dinosaurs where they've created models of, of the crests, either physical or, or computerized. And, you know, we actually, uh, if you go to the Field Museum, we have one that's, that's mocked up and you can make it honk. Um, so. <laughs> How long it took to make the movie, um, I don't know. I, I would imagine a, a couple of years um, is, is what they usually, but um, yeah, I don't know from. Yeah, so this was one of the first movies that made an extensive use of CGI, but a, a lot of it was actually also done with physical modeling. I know that. Um, uh, so, for example, um, the Velociraptors and the T-Rex were done in both ways. They had both um, physical models and some CGI, depending on the scene. Um, I think the newer ones are more reliant on CGI. So the earliest dinosaurs show up uh, about 230, 235 million years ago. Um, Excluding birds, um, they go extinct 65 million years ago, so uh, over 160 million years, basically. Um, yeah. yeah. Sorry, what's the big? The biggest fossil I have ever found. Um, I've, uh, I've found some large sauropod limb bones. Um, I mean, uh, I, don't, I wouldn't say I personally found I was on a team that helped find them. Um, so yeah, we, we have, uh, you know, one of the largest things we found was a um, sauropod humerus, an upper arm bone about this long. Um, so close to five feet long, so quite large. Um, so, a number of sauropods. I've never found a complete sauropod, though. They've always been sort of bits and pieces. What's the lifespan of a dinosaur? Great question. Um, we don't have uh, a very uh, good idea for most species. Um, we think that T. rex, it's around 30 years, um, give or take. Um, we can age dinosaurs, so we can look at their we can cut their bones and they actually have growth rings, kind of like tree rings. Um, and uh, so based on that, from a couple of T-Rexes, we think around 30 years, 30 to 35 might be the lifespan of a, of a T-Rex. Sauropods are, of course, uh, a little longer lived when they're big. Um, none that I've seen have estimates going more than, let's say, 80 years. Um, you. Yeah, so uh, the colors in this movie are entirely conjectural, um, and until very recently, uh, that's all we all we had were educated guesses, um, basically using living animals as 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 a model to infer what dinosaurs might have looked like. Uh, since 2010, um, people have been now finding. Um, preserved melanosomes in, primarily in the feathers, like I showed you on that microraptor, um, but even in some skin samples um, of, of a few dinosaurs. And so 
basically the melanosomes are little packets of color, little color cells that you have um, either in your skin or your pellage or plumage. And their dimensions and sizes uh, correlate with color. So, and here we're talking about mapping the browns, grays, and blacks. Uh, so there are other colors, the brighter colors, that wouldn't preserve because they do preserve differently. But um, from those, we think, for example, that there are some small feathered dinosaurs from China that had grayish body, but their, um, their arm or wing feathers were essentially white and black, uh, almost like a gull. They might have had a brownish crest. Um, there's a small uh, plant-eating dinosaur called Cetacosaurus that seems to have um, sort of a, a shading so that it's pale on the belly um, and brown or dark on its sides uh, with a little bit of camouflage, almost like a, a lizard. So uh, we're starting to get some very uh, basic ideas of what a few dinosaurs might, might have looked like. No. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated by the feathers. Uh, are, are, there, is there a sense of um, sort of why, um, you know, what, what ecological reasons that the insect raptors would have feathers? Um, um, we don't know exactly why feathers would have evolved, um, but clearly uh, they didn't evolve for flight because we have them in animals that are not flying and not that closely related to birds. So what we see is, is um, in the family tree of dinosaurs, um, especially among carnivorous dinosaurs, we see the first types of feathers are very simple structures. They have uh, sort of single hollow filaments. Then we see sort of filaments in bunches. Then we actually see feathers that have kind of a shaft and veins and then only in the more derived ones do we actually see what look like flight feathers and, and contour feathers and the kind of feathers you would see in a bird. So there seems to be sort of a progression in, in the complexity uh, as, you, as you move up the phylogenetic or, or family tree towards birds. Are, are the early structures more like hairs than They're like hairs. Uh, you would, if you were to look at them, they're single uh, sort of a filament, um, but they're hollow, which is a very major distinction between hairs and, and feathers. Some animals have hollow hairs. A few animals like polar bears have hollow hairs, but, but in generally hairs, mammalian hair is not hollow. Um, at the back. Um, so we think that certainly some of these uh, things like uh, Microraptor that I showed you a slide of probably either did glide or fly. Um, in fact, they don't just have those flight feathers on their forelimbs, they have them on their hind limbs as well. So th these animals essentially had four wings um, and uh, probably were able to glide, they're fairly small. <coughs> Um, why an animal the size of a velociraptor would have such feathers is, is it certainly was too big to fly, we don't know, but um, some of the smaller ones do seem to have some kind of flight capability and certainly birds, of course, um, evolved from animals looking like that, so. All the way at the back. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, now, they do say that the Velociraptor had the speed of a cheetah, and that's almost certainly bogus. Um, that would almost, uh, I mean, these animals would not have been slow, but there's nowhere ne near the cheetah speeds. Um, but um, would they have been able to run away? That's, it's hard to say. I mean, um, depends on a head start and so on and so forth. We don't really have great models for how animals of that size. We do have some trackways, and you can estimate speeds from trackways. So there are some trackways uh, from the early Jurassic of, of um, Arizona where the 
you can sort of infer the size of the animal from the size of the footprint, and then you can use the spacing between uh, stride, the stride length in the, in the trackways to infer speed. So we do have uh, evidence of some sort of, not huge, but mid-sized predatory dinosaurs moving at up to 25 miles an hour. Um, that's probably enough to run down a, a nine-year-old kid, but you know, in, in an open area versus a kitchen with a door and everything, I, who, who knows? <laughs> Um, yeah, so certainly um, birds uh, generally don't smell very well. There are a few exceptions. There are a few birds like turkey vultures that have very acute senses of smell. Um, it's harder to tell in dinosaurs, but the way we, we try to get at the sense of smell is by looking at the impression of their brain. So I showed you that model of, of the T-Rex brain. Um, and uh, at the very front of the brain is where the olfactory lobes, the, the sense of smell is. And uh, the relative size of that structure will tell you something, some, give you some indication of the sense of smell. It's not bad in T-Rex. It's pretty well elaborated. Um, things like Dromaeosaurus or Velociraptor, they seem to be smaller, um, probably not as reliant on their sense of smell as... Um, and certainly by comparison to mammals, these animals wouldn't have been able to smell as much. Um, as for their response times, um, I mean, I think you have to build in some movie magic, uh, you know. I, I'm sure these animals were, were, were pretty fast when they wanted to be. Um, you know, uh, of course, crocodilians are related, they're cold-blooded, but crocs can move very fast. <laughs> I've seen that. I think one last question and then wrap it up. Yeah, you. Um, are, uh, is, at the beginning, it says that the Velociraptor claws are retractable. Is that true? And in addition to that, if it is true, how does that work? Yeah, so uh, I wish they wouldn't put it that way. So when, when people talk about re retractable claws, you think of your cat at home. And in your cat, yeah, the claw actually gets pulled back. There's, there's a, a bony ring that it gets pulled back into. Um, in the velociraptors, what they mean is that that large sickle-shaped claw on the second toe is not used to walk with. It gets held up. Um, and that is, that is true. Um, so one thing where these guys were kind of uh, ahead of their game, you saw there was a couple of places where they had uh, velociraptor footprints after the eggs hatched. There were little two-toed footprints. Usually dinosaurs have uh, three-toed footprints. Um, and here they had two-toed footprints basically guessing that velociraptors held their, clothes up, or their claws up. Um, and we have later in 2008 actually found those, vel those types of, of footprints where you have two toes, and then the, the toe that would actually carry the big claw, you only see the very uh, part of it close to the foot impressed, and, and the claw and the rest is held up. Um, and we do find the fossils that way. We find the, the, the claw kind of pulled back. Um, but it's not pulled into a sheath like it is in a cat. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for coming and staying.